<clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, maybe it's a good time to start, I guess. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so good, af no, good afternoon, yes, correct. Good afternoon, everyone, again. I uh, welcome all participants in and out of Thailand to, to this month's uh, finals um, event by PSU Open Mobility 2022. And in, in fact, there are not so many days left before we are going to say goodbye to 2022. So I'm glad to, to have you all here on board, gathering up and sharing our knowledge and experiences as an inter intellectual community. So today, again, I will invite the speaker, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Robert McKenzie. Uh, we will cover the topic of social and regional variation in spoken English. And before we move on, as, as usual, uh, allow me to briefly introduce the, today's moderator, Ms. Fatima Laila J. Asa. Uh, Ms. J. Asa received her master from the Nakhilin Viro University in, in English. And currently, she has been working as a lecturer at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Prince of Sankar University, Thailand. Her research interests include English as an international language, translation, reading literacy, translanguaging, linguistics, and phonics. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Atan Fatima Laila J. Asa. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf. Well, assalamu alaikum. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting opportunity, actually, as part of our PSU Open Mobility 2022. And uh, thank you, Dr. Yusuf, again, our project manager, for your introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today as the last program of this year, right? Well, I'm Fatima Lelaji Asa, today moderator. And joining me today, we have Associate Professor Dr. Robert McKenzie to share knowledge and great experiences on social and regional variation in spoken English. Hi, Dr. Robert. Welcome back and glad to see you again this week. Well, we are so excited to hear about the work you have been doing into social linguistics and global Englishes. Well, everyone, are you all guys excited and ready for our topic today? If yes, can you please like uh, send some emotico, like wow emotico or hard emotico? Okay, great. Well, just a little housekeeping before we get started. So we all have a seamless webinar experience. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and I will bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for Q&A session at the end. Just for your information, this webinar is also being streamed live on our faculty's Facebook page. And now without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, Dr. Robert McKenzie. Well, Dr. Robert McKenzie is Associate Professor in sociolinguistics at Northumbria University, UK. His research is focused principally in the areas of variationist sociolinguistics, folk linguistics, global Englishes, social psychology of language, as well as quantitative and qualitative research methods in applied and sociolinguistics. He has a particular interest in public perceptions of and attitudes towards spoken English variation in the UK and Southeast and East Asia. And lately, this year in July, he has published his second monograph, Implicit and Explicit Language Attitudes, Mapping Linguistic Prejudice and Attitude Change in England in Ruthlet. Well, his research has featured in a large number of newspapers, television, and radio outlets, both within and out with the UK. And he is also the founding director of the Speaking of Prejudice project as well. And now, I think it's time, let's welcome our special guest, Associate Professor Dr. Robert McKenzie. Dr. Robert, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Fatima. That was very nice, and Dr. Well, Yusuf as well. And not yet, Doctor, but thank you. For that. Well, I know it's going Hopefully. to happen in the future, so I'm quite happy to call you Dr. Fatima. I mean, I mean, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> Um, thank you again for thank you again for 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 coming on a Saturday afternoon, people. I realise um, there's all that lovely shopping in Thailand and and and, and elsewhere, and you know it's the afternoon for you. It's, it's now eight half past eight in the morning in the UK, and it's minus five degrees. So if you see me all wrapped up and and rubbing my hands, is a thank particular you, you reason for that. Early, okay, for this session, okay. Yeah. Say that again. I thank you to you too for getting up so early for the session. Oh, that's so that's okay. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, and here well, it's I'm, raining. There it's raining. It's raining and a lovely day today. Is it raining? Yeah, in Thailand. It's especially oh, in the dear. southern part of Thailand. I'm very confused because I know that I know it should be getting into the dry season. Uh, not not yet. I mean, 
because it's at the end of the year it will be like rainy season mm, mm, mm. i thought i thought the rainy season finished but maybe i'm thinking bangkok <laughs> maybe in bangkok <laughs> maybe in bangkok okay as you can see so um Last week, I, I, if you were there, and thank you very much for coming again. So um, that's very nice of you. Last week, I did research methods. And that's one of the things I do. But I suppose the main thing that I do is look at language variation. I'm what you call a, a variationist, which means I'm interested in the types of variation in languages and between languages and between varieties. Um, so when, when, when Dr. Yusuf asked me if I wanted to to do another session. This was, this was the obvious one thing for me to do. Now, I realize some of you come from a more educational background. Um, so I won't assume that you know anything particular about social linguistics. But I'm guessing every time you teach in the classroom and you use listening materials, you're making a social linguistic decision about what varieties to use and what varieties to teach your students if you are a teacher. Um, if you come from a social linguistics background, some of this will be quite familiar to you, but I'll, I'll get on to other things. And last week, we had lots of really good questions. I'm not so um, arrogant to think that I know everything about this or that I'm um, share it, sharing my ideas with you perfectly. So please do feel free to stop me. Do feel, feel free to to ask questions, put something in the chat. I'm also going to play some speech samples so you don't have to listen to me for, for an hour and a half. So um, please, please do ask for them to be repeated or um, I'm using another computer. If it's not clear, just tell me, it's absolutely fine. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction to social linguistics, okay? And social linguistics is if people say, what is social linguistics? You say, well, it's usually language and society, but that's not, that's not very helpful. So let's talk about what it means. So the question is, what is social linguistics? If anybody, if anybody wants to give me a, an answer just now, that's fine, or I'll just keep talking. It's absolutely fine. <clears throat> Maybe if anyone. Anyone? how people use, I mean, the language in society, just analyze yep. how people use language in society. Yep. Yep. Okay, this is this a very, I'm going to give you some formal definitions in the beginning. So social linguistics is a very broad field, okay? It involves the study of social meaning of the different ways in which individuals and groups, and we know them as speech communities, employ language according to the perceived social context. So the important word here is perceived. We make choices about what language to use, depending on who we think we are talking to. We don't always get it right. So for example, if you go to Japan, and I've been to Japan quite a lot, people, people give out business cards and they give out business cards because they want to know someone's status. And if they know someone's status, in Japanese, they know which language to use. Okay, and I might come back to that later. So it's about the choices we make. Okay, so specific language features, and sometimes we call them variants, can provide specific information about the speaker. Now, that kind of information might tell us something, yeah, about their gender, maybe about their nationality, their age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for social linguists, when we're thinking about language, it's not just about describing, okay? It's not just about telling people. When someone speaks, it's not just, they're not just telling us information. The word there is de denotational, okay? They're not just telling us that's a tree or I'm hungry or um, I'm going to do this tomorrow. They also gives us information about who they are and perhaps also what they think, okay? The word that we, the kind of more modern word, and you might not find this in um, older social linguistics textbooks, but we talk about indexicality. So how someone speaks, and I'm dealing with speech here because speech has more variation. How someone speaks 
tells us something about their social class, their status, their region, their age, or their, ethnic their ethnicity. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking of playing a speech sample here, so there's some, um, I can hear some, I can hear some um, echo. Yes, it did. Um, I can hear the I think echo. Someone's, I think someone's got their, um, I think someone's got their sound on. No, I think someone's microphone's on. Yeah, I muted her already. Thank you, Carl. Okay, no problem, no problem. Good. No, I don't I don't hear any sound. Yeah. So I'll play a speech sample here. And what just so what can you tell me about this person? Just from their just from their um their speech. Uh, please tell me if it's playing. It's just about to start. So from the start, you want to turn right to the church and then right again to the mountains. From the mountains, you want to go straight onto the bridge. From the bridge, you want to go right past the lake. And then you want to turn left past the volcano down to the airport where you turn right and you go past the factory, right again to the hospital, and then Right again, you will reach the castle at the end. Okay, what could you tell me about that? Anything about the speaker? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be in depth. Yeah, the, the gender. Well, she's yeah, a what, 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 what gender? <laughs> she's she's a lady, female. like middle yep. age. So you 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 yep yep. Anything she's else? Giving direct, she's giving directions to somebody. Yeah, she's, yep. Yep. Just giving directions so you're, to somebody. You're, you're being denotational. You're telling me about what she's talking about. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And then, yeah, it's she, she used like very clear direction. I mean. So you're, you're saying maybe she's educated? Mm -hmm. Anything? Is she, a, is she a first uh, language speaker, a second language speaker? By the sound of her, her accent, I would say she is. So she's actually she's actually from from Cambridge, in the south of the United Kingdom. But you're telling me lots of things. Can you tell me something about her age? Is she young or old? I think mid middle age, still young. Middle, still young. Yeah. yeah, she's in her thirties now. What you've done is you're you've you've done some social linguistic analysis of her speech. You're not just you're not just got the information that she's talking, she's giving directions. It's very good that you, you, you realize she's giving directions. You've also told me something about who she is and what kind of person she is. So what you've done there, unconsciously or consciously, is you've, you've done some social linguistic analysis, okay? And that's really what social linguists, linguists do. We try and work out what, um, information about the person and what, what their social meaning is, okay? I'll go on. So for this reason, social linguists conduct research into language diversity, sometimes called variation. And I'm a variationist. Um, so from the different the way the different ways that people speak, we can tell a lot about them and a lot about what they intend to do as well. And I'll talk about that soon. Okay. Oops. Okay. So this is a little introduction to language variation. And again, some of you all know this. I've kind of focused on the UK a little bit because I thought it might be interesting. But of course, with Thai, it could be the same. Okay, so linguistic diversity, so linguistic difference, if you like, comes in different ways. We divide it into, and this is introduction to social linguistics in the first couple of chapters, stylistic variation, which means that the same speaker, the same person will speak differently in different situations. So for example, maybe when he or she is at a restaurant with their friends, or when he or she is at a job interview or speaking to their students, they'll speak in a different way. And that's called stylistic variation, maybe more formal or less formal, and other things. And what I'll talk about today mainly is social or regional variation. Okay. 
and that's sometimes called interspeaker variation. That people of different social classes, different ages, different genders, different areas will speak differently. So this is between speakers. So the first one is the same speakers, and social original variation is different speakers. I'm just going to talk a little bit about stylistic variation. Very little bit. Okay. Oops. Don't know why it's not. Ah, there we go. Okay. And this is the very formal definition, is, again. The speech of an individual, so the speech of a person, differs according to the social context. So in any introduction to social linguistics, you'll get some kind of sentence like this. So that's formal versus informal. Okay, so a, a, a very formal situation versus an informal situation, and according to who we think we're, we're speaking to. So when I said Dr. Fatima there, um, Fatima um, corrected me and said, I'm not a doctor there. She's telling me something about her educational status. Okay, but people, sometimes people without PhDs do the best research, Fatima. So don't worry about, about whether you're a doctor or not. Okay, so our speech differs according to who we think we are talking to. Yeah, Fe Fez is laughing. Yeah, <laughs> why is this laughing? Okay, this is called in social linguistics. I'm giving you a lot of. Um, words in the beginning. This is called audience design. Okay, it was very established in social linguistics. Um, Alan Bell, audience design. We choose, we select, we change our speech according to who we think we're talking to. This is called audience design. Okay. And I think I gave you this once before, but not maybe last year. I did a similar session last year. So I think I gave this example before. Now, if you study grammar, you are taught can is the present, aren't you? And could is the past. Hmm. So yes. does this sentence say, can you pass the salt today? And could you pass the salt yesterday? Yeah, because in English, when you teach to your students, can is present, who does pass? Is that what I'm saying here? Does anyone want to, to say anything in the chat or say anything? Yes, it's, it's quite tricky. <laughs> <laughs> English is quite tricky. <laughs> yeah. What's what's happening here? It's actually the formality of the sentence. May I put a few words? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Politeness. I think, uh, could you please, Asal, there is uh, a, a bit more politeness or have yeah, a regard the of the one who is being addressed. Uh, the more yeah. regard is there and there are less chances that he was very will pass the Asal. Could you please, that probably uh, he's not a person that you should ask someone to pass something, but with more respect okay. and regard, we are saying, could you please, Asal? Yeah. Okay. So every, for everybody, which one is more formal? Can or could? Could. Could. Okay. Now, another way I to look at this. Okay, hold on. Another another way to look at this is that could is more formal because the relationship is more distant. It's either distant because we don't know the person, it's distant in terms of the situation is more formal, or it's distant in the terms of hierarchy. So maybe this person, could you pass the salt, is my boss, for example. Okay, now, this is how we, this is in English, we, we often express politeness in terms of modal verbs. Yeah, so you know the word modal, modal comes from mood, mood, M-O-O-D. It expresses something about the emotion. That's why they're called modal verbs. Now, in Japanese, for example, you use different verbs. How would you express politeness in Thailand? I mean, you can use, I'm sorry, I'm afraid. Okay, you can use expressions. In Thai, how would you, would you do it in Thai? Normally, we use like the markers, like the final markers, like um, yep. ka or krap. There's another. Ka or, yeah, 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 yeah. So ka or, or kap, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, and the other things, I think you change the verbs as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes the okay. verbs so, Yeah, that's stylistic variation. And quite often we do this unconsciously. Okay, so I've given you an example of stylistic variation. I'm going, to, I'm going to throw that away now. 
Okay. And I'm going to focus on social and regional variation for the for the next what hour a uh, half how, how, how much time have I got? So uh about an hour, an hour, next hour? Yeah, okay. an hour and a half, yes. Yeah, an hour and a bit. Yeah. Okay. So when people think of language variation, they often think about how people speak differently. Not the same person, but different people. And that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well. If you're a variationist or you work in world Englishes, that's really what you're doing. You're looking at differences. Okay, so people, people's speech differs between different languages. So I'm speaking English, other people will speak Thai, other people, people will speak in Urdu or Punjabi in, in this group. And we also speak different language varieties. So I'm speaking, at the moment, I'm speaking some kind of standard Scottish English with you. But when I talk to people from my own city, from Glasgow, for example, like Juna, I am, um, I will speak Glasgow vernacular. So I change my speech between Scottish local local Glasgow English and Scottish standard mm -hmm. English, depending on who I'm talking to. And I, most social linguists tend to call these language varieties, but the old word is dialects. Dialects has a kind of negative meaning. It makes you think of old men living in the countryside or perhaps in a Thai sense, old farmers. Yeah, so I tend to use the word varieties, but you know what I mean. So, so we term, so people speak differently, different language varieties, but also in the same language. So many different varieties of English. So Thai English, Japanese English, Indian English, um, Scottish English, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, and quite often people speak different differently, between um, genders. So for example, sometimes, for example, in Thai, mainly men would say cap or crap. Yeah, cap kun crap. And women would say cap kun ka. Sorry for my rubbish Thai. Stop laughing at me, Faiza. <laughs> it's all right, I'm, I'm joking. I can see your face laughing. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, so um, that's called that's what we call gender absolute. Generally, males will use one form and females will use the other. I know it's a bit more complex than that, okay, but generally, males will use one form and females will use the other. But it's not just abs it's not just absolute. It's sometimes preferential. Yes, Mohammed. Uh, thank you for granting me the permission. I just wanted to ask one little thing when you talk about gender differences. Um, I was just reading before your lecture, I thought I should read something and I was reading a book where he mentioned the example, when we say the researcher will try to find the researcher uh, if he is good. So they use he for the researcher as a gender neuter term maybe. So when we can say a researcher might be a male or female, but we are using he referring back to the researcher as a, does it uh, like, uh, is this considered as a neuter gender? In this case. You mean he, he? He? Yes. We in tend, we tend in, in research now in the UK, we tend to use he stroke she. Okay. I don't tend to use he or she. I tend to use, I tend to use the researcher or the names of the researcher, but I realize this is very culturally different. And okay, and when we are referring it back again in the later part of the of the, of the sentence, like the researcher, uh, the, the researcher, uh, he is good at that. The one I tend to write in the passive. Uh, if you're if you're asking about what I do or what most people do, I'll, I'll give you two different answers. I'm trained as a psychologist. So I tend to I tend to write in the passive. So I don't usually say he or she conducted the research. I say the research was conducted. But other people who do write in active rather than passive would mainly write. So for example, Smith 2012 noted, because generally in academic writing, the the male maleness or femaleness isn't important. Uh, for okay, me. But uh, when we say I'm going to have to move yeah. on though because yes, because there's, there's there's a lot of people there. I hope that helps. So yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. 
Okay, so there's evidence in English, and this isn't absolute, it's about preferential. And preferential doesn't mean yes or no, it means more or less. So social ling linguists usually look at frequencies. We usually compare frequencies. So in English, females tend to employ more modal verbs in English, and this is called hedging, okay? So females tend to say more frequently than males. It might be, it may be, there's a greater possibility. And in some ways, <clears throat> that's a verbal skill. That's a great, that's greater use of language because you're talking about possibilities. It's the type of thing we have to do in academic English. We don't say my study proves. We say my study may, may point to, um, suggests, and that's hedging. Okay, and there's more evidence that females are better than that. There's one negative point of hedging. It makes you sound uncertain. Okay, so sometimes people believe you less than males who are very, yes, I'm right. Okay, but actually it's this female employment of modal verbs. It's actually a really good thing because it's a language skill. Okay, and there's some debate of whether females are born as better language users or is it something which is socially learned okay for me it's socially learned that females you know work in better groups but it's not it's just a, it's just a tendency okay so are there any preferential gender features in thai or thai english does anyone want to say i don't mean cow or cap but preferential like from from my observation and my direct mm -hmm. experience not normally like the uh lady thai ladies speak longer than <laughs> than men <laughs> i'm not sure it's universal or not <laughs> and talk that much is a very older. dangerous thing to say <laughs> <laughs> um i'll give you an example in japanese if anybody's ever been to japan females a sign of femaleness or young females tends to be a higher intonation so if you go into a Japanese shop, if anybody's ever been to Japan, they'll say in Japanese, welcome to our shop. Yeah, welcome to our store. And it'll be, very high. A man would never say it like that. A man would say, and it's not just, it's not just a difference, phys physiological difference. It's about politeness and it's preferential. It's not all the time, but it's a, it's a, it's a preference. Okay. Um, Fatima, that's a very dangerous thing you say. I'm going to move on. <laughs> okay, so you probably know, if you've, if you've ever studied social linguistics, you probably know that the thing that we um, investigated in the beginning was social class. Okay? The very early studies in, in America by Lebov looked at social class. And here's, here's the study. So, roticity, which is kind of saying um, fourth floor, or fourth floor, so using the using the r sound after the the vowel in words like for, it's called post vocalic r. So use of post vocalic r as a symbol of prestige in New York City. So what Lebov did is he asked people to say in in department stores he asked the people who worked there to say fourth floor or fourth floor, and he counted. The pronunciation of R, the R sound or not, after a vowel, for example, in fourth, has social meaning for this community. Now, in New York, if you pronounce the R, it's considered to be upper class, so more down, more frequently for middle class and upper class. And if you don't pronounce the R and you say fourth floor, it's considered to be working class. And Lebov demonstrated this in 1966, showed that this was systematic. It's called patterned variation, okay? Now, what's interesting for us, oops, what's interesting for the UK, or for particularly England, is that the R sound is the negative sound, the lower class sound in England, and the, like the fourth floor, party banana, is the, is the traditionally this high status sound. So if it's different in the UK and different in the US, it shows, it's not the sound itself, it's the social meaning of the sound, yeah? So the R sound 
is considered high class in New York, but lower class in the south of England. So it shows it's not the sound itself, it's the social meaning of the sound to what it tells us about the people who speak it. Okay. Um, anything you want to say about anything social class in Thai, Thai English? Or another time? It's, it's about the word choices. That yeah, can... it's, it's, about, it's not about yes or no. It's about more or less. Mm. Okay. It's not like you can say um, people who are working class will do this or that. But it, this could be phonological. It could be sounds. It could be words. Mm -hmm. It could be word order. So syntax. It could be grammar or it could be morphology. Mm -hmm. I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about morphology in a bit. Mm -hmm. So, but it's very hard to understand because it's very unconscious. Yeah, it's very unconscious. Okay. Social linguistics is about what we know unconsciously to consciously. Mohammed, yeah, I'll have to make this short though, Mohammed, because there's lots of people here. Uh, thank you. Okay, in in one city here in our country, they say open, and in another city they say open. Yeah, and that's that's, that's regional another... variation. Okay, is it at phonetic level we can say? Uh, you tell me. It sounds like Lexus. Sounds like words to me, but I, what you know better than me. Okay, there there is another example. They always pronounce like Kate and Blake, not Cat and Black. Yeah, that's that's fun. That sounds to me phonological, but I'm. I'm no expert. That's that. That's not social class variation. I'm guessing it's regional variation. Okay, it will be considered as regional. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, I'll move on then. Here we go. So, ethnicity. So, in the UK, many speakers of third generation South Indian heritage, and I mean South Indian, you know. Um, for example, Dravidian towards Sri Lanka tend to employ the retroflex de and t instead of t and d in English. Now, they, they weren't born in India, they were born in the UK. Their parents may even have been born in the UK. Okay, so the fact is that um, maybe I'll play. I think I have an Indian speech, not a Pakistani speech one, but an Indian speech community. I'll play it here and please listen for the r sound and for the d. And two. This speaker comes from the UK. This speaker was born in the UK. Oh, please. It takes a little bit to start. Hello, everyone. Uh, now I'm going to explain uh, how to reach the castle from start position. If you go straight from the start road, you'll find the search at the end of the road. Then you should take left turn. Uh, so you will find mountain then after the bridge then finally you'll get the you'll reach the lake position so at the end of the road you'll find the airport uh, so in between the lake as well as airport you'll you'll cross the volcano uh, take a left turn you'll find the factory then again you should take the left turn at the end of the road you will you can see the hospital finally you should Take the right turn, then you'll get the castle. Thank you. Okay. Now, probably if you're listening to that, you might say this person's this person this person's first language isn't English, but it is. She was born in UK, so in Kachuru's idea of world English is, she's speaking British English. Yeah. So for Kachuru, that's British English, even though you might identify as I don't know. Um, South Indian English or Sri Lankan English she speaks of she, she's 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 um, bilingual in Dravidian a Dravidian language which is the south of India and um, and Sri Lanka and and English so English is her first language she was born in England England I mean rather than UK she was born in England and her parents were probably born here too yeah so that's just to show you that even within for example British English there's ethnic differences Okay, she's a, she's a particularly um, different example. So it's very hard to find speakers like that in the UK, but they do exist. Okay, so 
also in region, categorization of Southern US speech and Midwest US English speech. So people, as uh, Mohammed talked about before, people of different regions of the same um, variety will speak, speak similarly. Okay. So for example, in England, people in the North in words such as trap and grass will use the short Northern English sound a ah, and the Southern English sound r. Ah. Would you like me, is it useful for me to play more speech samples or do you want me to move on? Do you want me to give maybe, you an example of that? Yeah, maybe you can give it some examples. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is the English um, speech samples. Sorry, just give me a minute, please. I have to turn the... Um, okay. I'll show you the English speech samples. I'm going to give you a northern example, and I want you to I want you to hear the difference between the north and the south, if I can. Um, I do apologize. It's I'm ha my my. Oh, we can we oh we can come back later if like or we can go on. Uh, I can I can get I think I've got it. I've got the northern example now. Uh -huh. I've got some northern examples now, or or do I? Yeah, that's uh, great. Sorry, I do apologize. It's just that my university server isn't working today, which is really horrible. Got it. Um, this is the this is this is the northern sounds. Okay. Northern English. Laugh. 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 Dance. Trap. Fast. Grass. Master. Okay, you probably hear the so for example the short sound trap and grass. Yes. And now I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the southern sounds. Uh, and you'll hear the longer sound. This time it's longer. Laugh. 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 Dance. Trap. Fast. Grass. Master, can you can you hear? And I know the second speaker is very quiet person. Could you hear the difference between, for example, trap and and sorry, grass and grass? Yeah, do you hear the difference? So in, in the north it's short grass, and in the, the south it's grass. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the dictionary, and it's got the phonetic spelling, and the, probably the ones that you you teach your students, it will give you the long sound. But then, for example, like, um, for example, um, Dr. Yusuf came to study in Southampton. He would hear grass. OK, that's very fine. If, imagine that you come and study in Manchester or Leeds. You will hear you've been taught grass, but you come and everybody's saying grass, trap, bath. Yeah. So we call that the trap bath distinction. So it's a really... So, when we're learning even in UK English, there's huge regional differences. This is the major one between the north and the south of England. I'm not English, I'm Scottish, but I'm very similar in this sense to the north of England. Okay, I have, I, I wouldn't say grass, I would say grass, grass. Slightly different from the north of England, but variation is so hard. So this, in thinking about your students, it's hard because when we're teaching English, we're really teaching Englishes. Yeah, and you can ask me about that later, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to discuss about what you might think about that. Okay, so this is called the trap bath split, the trap bath split in Southern English, which does not exist in Northern English. So, in Southern English, there's trap and bar. So one is short, one is long. In the North of England, it's the same sound: trap bath. Very complex. Okay. <clears throat> You could also say this, for example, between High English, couldn't you? And I'll, I'll come back to this later. There's certain features of English that people use in Thailand, phono phonological, lexical, and we'll come back to that later. Also in Pakistan, for example, and anywhere else, 
and we'll talk about this. We'll talk about this later. Okay, now, when I was giving you those speech samples, this is my, um, this is how I get the speech samples. There's a little map, and I ask people to speak. Um, so you can see start, castle, mountains, bridge, lake, um, volcano, airport, factory, hospital, castle. Some of that is to elicit second, certain sounds. So, for example, the one at the end, castle, could be castle or castle. Yeah. Um, some people will say mountains. Some people will say mountains. Some people will say volcano. In Thailand, people might say volcano. Is that right? Volcano? The V? Yep. So that's to, it, what, this is particularly done to elicit differences. Okay. Um, please feel free to use that. Of course, if, if you use it, please, um, please, you know, please reference me in your paper, but feel, please feel free to use it. If you, the reason I use this is to try and get spontaneous speech. Social linguists are interested to get natural speech. And when you're giving directions, you're not telling someone about who you are. I'm not saying I'm Scottish from the start position or I'm male, go past the castle. People don't know who you are, but you're still giving speech. So social linguists tend to, tend, we call this the vernacular. Okay, in, in social linguistics, this is called the vernacular. They're trying to get natural speech from people and then to use it to, to, to analyze. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later if you want. Okay, so, so what? So what about all this? Yeah, I've been talking for, I don't know, what's the time? I've been talking for quite a long time, yeah. Apologies. What does this mean? And, and you know, in terms of world Englishes and ideas of L1 and L2, it means quite a lot. Okay, so every language or language variety is not fixed and changes through time in terms of features, yeah? It's natural that languages are different, language varieties are different and they change. There's not some time when language was fixed and it's better or worse. Although people will tell you this. People will say, oh, in Shakespeare's time, people spoke brilliantly. For a social linguist, that's nonsense, okay? It's always changing. Often as a result of language contact and language attitudes. So for example, a hundred years ago, many words in Japanese or Japanese English came from Chinese and French. But now many of the new words in Japanese or Japanese English come from English. Why? Why did they choose English words? Not, not French words or Urdu words or why? It's because of language attitudes. People are, people are favorable towards English. They think it makes them sound international, makes them sound cool. So they've nativized, uh, the old word for this is borrowing. They've borrowed lots of words from English into Japanese. I'll give you some examples. Oel, Toronto, Homresu, Shirabashito, Ron Pari, Companion. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at those words, OL, all from English, Toronto, Homresu, Shirabashito, Ron Pari, and Companion. Tell me, which words in English do you think they come from? Pronto. Companion. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. And what's the meaning in Japanese? Have a have a little think first. It's very difficult because if you've never been to Japan, there's no way to know. Okay, 
<clears throat> Anyone want to give me OL? Anyone want to give me a try? Don't be shy. You can say in the chat if you want. <laughs> Everybody's shy. Don't worry. OL. Yep. Brilliant Wen Tang. Office lady. It comes from the word office lady in English. Okay, okay. Office lady. Office lady means a worker in a Japanese company who probably is younger. And when she gets married, traditionally, she will stop working in the company. Okay, Japan is a very male and traditionally a very male, female divided society. And it means a woman who works in a, co a company before she gets married. Very old fashioned. Toronto? Tuna, you said Toronto is from the word front. Yep. And fronto. Yep. It, it's actually fronto because it's nativized into Japanese language. Toronto means front and it means reception desk. Reception desk, because a traditional Japanese hotel doesn't have a reception desk. Okay, the front when, desk. Maybe, <laughs> 40, 50 years ago, Japanese in Japan, they started building Western style hotels or American style hotels, and they needed to call the bit at the front of the hotel something because it's very different from Japanese hotels. And they called it a fronto. They used the word English front because that front. You'll never get this. Shirubash, Shirubashito. This comes from the word silver and seat. Shiruba, Shiruba. Remember, they're nativizing the English sounds into the Japanese language, so there's no V. Shiruba, Shiruba, Shiruba. And Shito is seat. Silver seat is, if you go onto a Japanese train or bus, it's the place for older people. Silver, silver hair. Seat, because older people have grey hair, silver seat. So it sounds more polite in Japanese because in Japanese you can't say these people are really old, they've, but they've got silver hair. Okay, Ron Paddy, hard again. This word is an abbreviation of London and Paris. Okay, Ron Paddy. There's no wrist sound. There's no this sound in Japanese, so it's r Ron Ron Paddy. London, Paris. It means, <laughs> it's, a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit negative. It means that when you're, you have a, <laughs> your one, one eye is looking one way and one eye is looking the other. Okay, it means, it means in English, cross-eyed. Okay, it's a, a kind of, a kind of disability, a kind of physical, physical, yeah. London and Paris. One eye is looking at London, one eye is looking at Paris. Bit, bit rude, slightly rude. Companion, as um, as Tuna said, companion is from the word companion. Yeah, no C sound in English and in, in Japanese, so the K sound. But what does it mean? It's a word which Japanese schoolgirls traditionally used when they said, I have a secret boyfriend. Mm. Why did they use an English word? The reason they used an English word is so that older people would not understand. If they were talking on their mobile and, their, for example, their parents would listen and they said the Japanese word, their parents would know. But when they say a companion, their parents don't know. So sometimes variation can be used for in-group language. Yeah, and this is Jap Japanese school girl language. Very interesting, no? Very interesting for me anyway. Okay, hope I'm not spending too much time on this stuff. Okay, so when I'm thinking in Thai, I'm not great in Thai, but you've got the word hi so. Hi so means. Yeah, anyone high tell class, me? High class. Yeah, people. high class. Yeah, and it comes from. High society. High society? Yeah. yeah. So in, in Thai, you do exactly the same thing. Now, mm. The question of whether this is Thai language or Thai English is not important. It's just used by Thai people. Is it English? Is it Thai? It's not really important. It's just used by Thai people in, in communication. Can you think of any others? Can you teach me any others? 
is when we call like uh, we, we use English like in train kind of we, we, we normally like loan the words but we have in a, a different meaning in Thai there, yeah, there are so many like in English Japanese, words. Yeah. Yep. yeah so you take an English word and you loan it something someone said something in chat as well uh, just like in Philippines yep that's right it's it's done all over the world we do this in English as well we often use French words for example so we do this in English too it doesn't just happen English to other languages happen between languages okay so here, here we are. So what we've got to so far, and I know I've been talking quite a lot, all varieties are systematic. They're all correct. Linguistically, all varieties have their own rules. Indian English has its own rules. Scottish English has its own rules. Manchester English has its own rules. Yeah. But some varieties are perceived as standard or correct, English or Thai, etc not because they're better or more correct than others. If all varieties are systematic, the idea of better and worse is, is meaningless, yeah? So why do we talk about standard Englishes and standard Thai? Why? Because it's not about linguistics. It's associated with the status and the power of the speakers. So, for example, if you think standard English in UK in, in England is spoken, is people say that the standard variety of England is the southern variety, because that's where the power is. Where do you think it is in France? Where does French, standard French, spoken? Paris. In Japan? Tokyo. In England, uh, sorry, in Italy, and uh, sorry, in, in Spain, Madrid. In Thailand, is it around the central part? Do people say standard Thai? It's because that's where the power is. Yeah, it's nothing to do with the language being better or worse. It's to do with these people have the power, these people have the status, so they say what they speak is stand status. Is standard. That, so standard is a bit of a strange word. It's not really about good or bad. It's about high or low status. Yeah. But it's not about linguistics because all languages are, are systematic. Okay. So others viewed it non-standard, again, associated with lower status of speakers. So when people say, oh, I don't like Indian English, what they're saying is, I don't think these people have sta high status. Yeah. That's all it is and the ideas of good and bad. And these non-standard, they might be high standard are usually thought as, the people are usually thought to be more educated, more intelligent, more ambitious. But these lower, these social, these non-standard varieties are usually thought to be um, more friendly, more um, honest, more open. And this is what we say. So for example, people, whenever I live, people from Newcastle, Newcastle English is, generally thought to be non-standard English by many people in England, but they say, oh, the people, people who live in Newcastle are very friendly, they're very honest. And I'm guessing you can do the same thing about this in Thailand or wherever you come from. Yeah. Okay. And um, for example, African-American vernacular English, so black English in the US is quite often thought of as being negative or incorrect. But actually, you know, you've got all these white rappers saying it because it sounds cool. It sounds like you're from the street. So there's these two things. Um, so I'm going on. I'm going on a bit about this. But whilst it's it's not got high status, high intelligence, high ideas of high education, it's thought of as being honest and cool. And yeah, and I'm guessing you can do the same in Bangkok, for example. Okay, I've got a the YouTube thing. I'll, I'll give it for later because I'm talking quite a lot at the moment. Okay, now I've kind of got to that point. I'm kind of halfway through. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Because I'm going on to a different part now. Does anyone want to say anything? Not for now. That's all right. Okay, okay well, Mohammed. Okay, uh, you talked about like uh, second language or first 
there is always have been a confusion among us the difference what is the difference between second language and the foreign language um for me nothing these are just these are just um terms that people give is it the same but if you look at cat i'm going to talk about catcher catcher talks about inner outer and expanding so cat what catcher meant by second language was places where um was colonized so he would say for example but this is 40 years ago that indian people spoke english as a second language but to me this is very old fashioned okay is it is the case same for the difference between mother tongue and the first language and the native language yeah the um, as as someone like um dr yusuf will tell you these terms are very loaded these terms are very controversial ideas of nativeness and and um, first language and second language and mother language the what you'll see in the literature is that people will say well most people in the world are bilingual so for example i'm guessing you can speak urdu and another variety another language yeah you're that's the norm yes. it's not strange most people here can speak thai and english you're bilingual so the ideas of mother tongue and first and second language are very very strange yeah but i i think that's for another lecture that's for a second language acquisition class but yeah good point and i'm hoping that some people will talk about l1 and l2 and non native and native at the end of the class yeah okay so i'm going to go on to how english will vary and i realize i've talked quite a lot how um should i finish just before 10 for and for yes. questions so yes. half an hour you, is everybody okay to listen to me for half an hour yes <laughs> okay sure. so actually there is a question in the chat box i guess oh, okay thank you um if if we are teaching for those who are going to take ielts or which variety of english can we teach that is a great question and for me it's about it's about um this is what i think but i i don't have to teach to folks so you know be be careful for me it's about teaching differences different varieties of english if you expose your writing is okay because there's not so much variation yeah there's not the same amount of variation in writing because writing is just a representation of speech but in speech there's lots of variation so what i did or what i did with my own students when i was teaching tefl a long time ago as i taught them lots of different varieties for listening lots of different speakers because in the future when you go between um communities you need to be able to understand because that's what we do in our first language if you go from the south of thailand to chiang mai or isan you have to cope with the variation there in thai it's the same in english it just so happens in english because so many people speak it all over the world that the it's not just thai varieties or lao varieties you have to worry about it's also variation between japanese english and chinese english and indian english and south american english yeah that's a great question thank you for asking that i think it's kind of one for the end but great question so i'll talk about a little bit about how um english varies in terms of sounds for phon phonology and then at the end i'm quite happy to open this up it's really really good questions i see where we're going here thank you very much okay so in southern english as you said before you'll get the sound card okay and in the no scottish english you'll get card okay so you get so that again the sound the the r sound card and card so within different us and uk varieties we've got the frequent use of the r roticity the r sound yeah i'm guessing you have this in thai as well okay and this is just for later this is a bbc this is some accents and dialects because i realized that dr yusuf puts this online and you can look at different varieties in the uk but in the uk at the moment there's generational change okay young people and old people speak differently in the frequency of which they use okay young people use some features more or less than older people 
And this tells us something about language change. And some of the changes in progress in the UK at the moment are these. You might not know these. So many people in the south of England and in the big cities in England, I mean in England, not in Scotland, are dropping the H sound. So, for example, in words like house would now be pro pronounced house. And this is a change in progress. It's becoming more frequent amongst young people. The sound of think is becoming fronted, like with your teeth, and now is being produced as think, think, uh, or, you know, uh, tooth, tooth, instead of tooth, tooth. It's been fronted, yeah. A, a change which is very early stages in progress in multicultural London English, in parts of London, is called DH fronting. So this is becoming this. Yeah. So this and this. So that and this. Yeah. The, the the sound is being replaced by the at the beginning of the word. Or in the in the 1970s, in the middle of the word, more medial position. So the word bother or brother would be brother, the the sound. So there's lots of different things happening. Okay, and as you probably know, increased glottalization. So t, so bottle is becoming bottle. And you even notice that, for example, the older members of the, the British royal family would say bottle, but the younger members more frequently would say bottle. So this is a change in progress. When you've got the double T in the middle of the word, it's been the, the sound is changing. So these are things which are happening in the UK. Why are some older people critical of the way younger people speak? Because they grew up with certain norms of ideas of what is good and bad. And when younger people change those norms, they say it's not correct. What happens in the end is that these older people die eventually. Yeah, they die. They die first. And for example, this think will become normal. So for example, does, can anyone tell me what this finger is called in English? Thumb. What's this? Yeah, thumb. But it's got a B at the end. Why is there a B at the end? It's very strange. 500 years ago, people in England used to say thumb, thumb. Yeah, that's why it's got to be at the end. Younger people said, let's, younger people started to use thumb more frequently, more and more generations. And then those older people died and it became thumb. That's how languages change. They change throughout time. The older generation uses something more, more frequently. Those people die and this becomes the normal. That's the way it works. So you can see the old influence from the spelling. Yeah. You can find the old pronunciations often from the spelling. Thumb, comb. Yeah. Okay. So um, the people who change languages in the beginning are called early adopters. And the people who resist it, usually older people at the end, are called laggards. Okay, and if you want to read more about this, um, please read Penelope Eckert, if you're interested in this, but uh, I won't go into it just now. There's an apostrophe protection society, you know the word uh, S apostrophe in spelling. So you've got the green grocers there. It's changing in English, it's becoming old fashioned, but there's an apostrophe protection society. People, older people who want to protect it, but these people are all dying. Okay, in 20 years time, nobody or very few people will use the S apostrophe. It's beginning to die out. That's a, that's a feature of language change. I'm sure you can do that. If you want to see the apostrophe side to there, it is there. Okay, I'll move on. Morphosyntax is a very um, linguistic term. What do I mean? Word ending. So in Southern England, you will say, how are you? In Scotland, 
or Ireland or Newcastle, where I live, you will say, how are you? So how are you? One person, how are you two? Seems logical to me. Or in the United States, how y'all in the Southern United States? So there's three examples of how to use the same thing. Three, which one would you say is correct? The first one, the third one, the first one is considered standard by many people, but that's because the power comes from Southern United of England, the South of England, and the Midwest of the United States. That's where the power is. Yeah, it doesn't mean use or y'all are any more correct. If you ask me, use is more logical. How are you? How are yous? Like in French, tu and vous. Okay, so. Um, if you ask young people what they, they use more, it's be like. I was like, I was like. So before, you older people might say more frequently, um, 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 mm. <laughs> they use like, I was like. Okay. Listen to young people in the UK and the US and listen out for this next time you watch, watch a film. So this is becoming more frequent in English in the US. Have a look at this. John is good at sport. John is good at sports. Which do you use? Both. Okay. Which one? Both. I can't hear. So, uh, there's a, uh, someone's mic isn't working. First one? Both. Depends yeah. on. Depends on what? Yeah, it depends on like um, sometimes my perception about the, the, the kinds of sports. If the only one I use the first one, if they are so good at many sports, I use the second one. Okay. If they were good at many sports, I tend to use the first one. This is morphology. Both are correct. Mm -hmm. But it depends on it depends on your, your background, your exposure. Yeah. Okay. A bit a bit more, I hope. Okay. Um, so we've looked at morphology, we've looked at like word ordered sport and sports, we've looked at phonology, also lexis, which means words. When we think about variation, we think of words. Now, this is some Scottish terms and play, um, I think the only person who's going to be really good at this is tuna, but we'll see. I, a bramble, drink, burn, bray, dram. Have a go. <laughs> Let 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 Bre, tuna, bre like tuna the tell eel, me. drama, uh, like a no, okay. uh, very small tuna. Please tuna. I oh, okay. I tuna. Yes. <laughs> I means yes. Bramble. Ah, uh, bramble. I've never heard of this. A bramble in English is a black currant. Oh. <laughs> Dreshi. Oh, sorry. Um, a bird, a drink. Drink like uh, cold, wet weather. Uh, cold, cold, wet weather. Yeah. A burn. Burn uh, is a kind of creek, uh, like river bed, but is it some? Yeah. Some, like, it's a small creek, stream. Small stream. Or the small word stream. in American English is this creek. The word yeah. in in um, English English is a uh, stream. A bray. A bray is a hill. Uh, a small hill. hill. A small hill. And a dram. Drama whisky. Uh, whiskey. <laughs> it's a small, it's a, it's a measure of whiskey. Okay. So these are words which any Scottish person will know. Okay. There's no reason why you should know them if you've never been to Scotland. But I've got, obviously Tuna has. Okay. So there's increased lexical, as more and more people speak English, there's more and more lexical variation, more and more words. Here's some words, I and I, Jamaican English, mug cup, Japanese English, seized of the matter, Indian English, perhaps not Pakistani English, pudding, Italian English, switchy, French English, business, businessness menka. Can you tell me the meanings of those words? Have a think. If you've never been to these places, you might not know.
please feel free yes, to yes 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 i think i know the second last word business uh -huh. worker it yep. actually is, is the same in bulgarian uh businesswoman yeah, a business to... yep uh, uh, yeah actually businesswoman businesswoman business yes is it really i always thought men come in is that right thank you for where are you from well originally i'm from bulgaria uh i was teaching in thailand now in korea but originally i'm from bulgaria so you know a bit you know a bit of russian yes yes and it's exactly the same word we would use in bulgarian if we refer to a businesswoman yeah that's great thank you so much i was told i was told it was businessman but i've learned something new today thank you so yeah. much valentine thanks yep that's really helpful thank you okay I'll, I'll help you i and i in jamaican english means we me and you i and i as we as a group i and i makes sense mug cup if you've ever been to japan the the cups are very small okay you when you get japanese tea the cups are very small when the Portuguese came in 400, 500 years ago, they brought bigger cups, a mug cup, yeah, a big cup, mug cup, and a Japanese cup. Seized of the matter means it's very important in formal Indian English. Footing means running. It means to go running for sport like a marathon. A marathon is footing. Switchy, if you know French, ER in French tells you it's a verb. Switchy means to switch light on and off. Yeah. And business this men cap, business woman. Thank you, Valentine. Okay. Now, many people will say these were these these are incorrect. But actually, they're not incorrect. We're just saying because these speakers are considered L2 speakers of English, that people will say it's correct, but linguistically, it's not correct or incorrect. Actually, for social linguists, it's very... So the extent to which listeners perceive Lexis is correct depends upon the context and how we think of the speakers. So I and I, grammatically, is not wrong. It's just that because it's in Jamaica that people automatically think it might be correct or incorrect. Okay, Oof. many of you will know about Kachiru's World English's model, and I think I'll actually show you the model in the beginning because I'm getting to the end. I'm, I... Okay, can you see this? It's not very big. Kachiru talks about, in 1982, talks about the inner circle, the outer circle, and the expanding circle. And this is a model of English spread. Sorry, I'm really sorry if it's very small. It works better on a, a big PowerPoint. The inner circle, Kachiru says, are countries like Australia, UK, and USA. The outer circle, he says, are countries like Bangladesh, Ghana, India, Kenya, Malaysia, Nigeria, Philippines, etc., Sri Lanka, and is that Singapore? Yep. And then the expanding circle is really all the left, all the rest. So for example, he would put Pakistan in the outer circle, and Thailand in the expanding circle. Why? Can anyone, I know some of you know already, what are the differences between these countries? The colonization. Yep, so outer circle are countries which Kachiru has considered to have been colonized. And I know if you go to Thailand, people will say, Thailand's never been colonized. I understand. So Thailand would be in the expanding circle. The inner circle, is countries like the US where Kachiru considered where people were native would be. This is very old fashioned, it's 40 years ago. And the expanding circle is everybody else. Now, this maybe worked 40 years ago when a country like Myanmar would be in the outer circle. Okay, Myanmar, which was a British colony, but Burma, if you like, 40 years ago. But a country like Norway or Sweden or Holland, people are very fluent in English. 
you might argue that there's a Dutch variety, a Holland variety of English. So this idea of native and non-native doesn't work very well, and I'll show you why. So, uh, okay. Kachira's concentric model, which I just showed you there, has been very influential. There's criticisms of this model, and I'm happy to discuss this later. So, for example, the idea of US English and UK English, for me, is very strange. I've showed you the, some of the variation in English in the UK. Yeah, I'm speaking Scottish English. I, I don't know what British English means. Yeah. It relies on geography. Remember I played the Indian speech sample? If, if, you, if I asked you, you'd probably say that person comes from India, but she doesn't. She comes from the UK. So does she speak British English? Although it's got features of Indian English, does she, what does she speak? Okay. Saying that Thai English, for example, belongs to this expanding circle is very odd. It just means it's all the other things. There's lots of differences between the English spoken in Thailand and the English spoken in Japan. To say it's all in the expanding circle is very strange. And the idea of nativeness and non-native is very strange. Most people in the world, as we said with Mohammed, are bilingual. What does it mean? When I think of native or non-native, I think native speaker of what? I'm a native speaker of Scottish English, if you like, or an L1 speaker of Scottish English. But people in, I don't know, for example, Singapore are first language speakers of Singapore English or first language speakers of Indian English. Yeah, the idea of non-native, I'd say non-native or native speaker of what? Okay, and if you call something the inner circle, it makes it sound like it's more important or at the center or more historically important. Saying something is in the expanding circle makes it sound like it's on the outside. So actually looking at it like this is very, it's quite odd. Um, I'm not going to get into this just now, but other models exist. Freven's 1992, Map of World Englishes and MacArthur's Model of World Englishes. I, my own view of this is these are useful to think, but they're not perfect. There's lots of problems with trying to talk about different Englishes. And some, some people can ask me about this after and we can discuss it. I've not got the answer. My feeling is just to be very critical when somebody tells you about, you know, what's it, inner or outer or, or native or non-native. And we kind of talked about this thing, these things already. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm going to play some speech samples. Do you want to hear, do you want to hear speech samples or not? I've only got five, 10 minutes. So does anyone want to hear some speech samples or not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll do some, I'll do some conclusions here because I realize it's hard to listen to, to someone for, 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 for an hour and a half. I'll do some conclusions. All English language varieties, all language varieties are systematic. Okay, this is what social linguistic research has taught us in the last 60 years. They all have very complex rules. So in linguistic terms, all varieties are equal. No variety is more or less correct, more or less beautiful. When people say, I don't understand, they sometimes say, oh, people from Ireland speak very quickly. That's just not true. No variety is spoken more quickly or slowly than another. Some people speak quickly and some people speak slowly, but it's not depending on the variety that they speak. Sometimes... If you don't understand, you think the person is speaking quickly. Yeah. That's what, why we have that. I was, I had a cup of coffee this morning. I started at eight o'clock teaching. I'm probably quicker now than I was an hour ago because I'm more woken up and I've had a cup of coffee and probably my heart's beating a little bit faster. Yeah. It's getting, you know, quite late in Thailand in the afternoon. You're probably a bit slower when you speak. That's natural. 
when we're talking about standardness, it's about the speakers. It's not about the language. The language reflects the speakers. Okay, so ideas of standardness are not. It's not about linguistics. It's about social judgment. Okay. So judgments reflect associations with status. Some speech has high status, intelligent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Others has social attractiveness, called warmth in psychology. So um, more honest, more friendly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you think, for example, we ask British people what they think, they think that French sounds soft and romantic, but German language maybe sounds hard and efficient. That's because of what many people in Britain traditionally think of French culture and German culture. German culture is traditionally very technical and harsh and efficient, and French culture for many British people in the past is very romantic and Paris and soft, and etc. Okay, that's why we have those connotations, that, those evaluations. Last page, I promise. There's lots of variation in English in terms of sounds, phonology, phonetics, if you will, intonation, morphosyntactic, so sport and sports, and lexis, so for example, words, within and between the inner circle, outer circle, and expanding circle. There's lots of variation. And if, like me, you're a variationist, this is great. This is what I do. The difficulty for both native and non-native speakers to identify different varieties. Okay, even if English isn't your, is your first or your second language, it doesn't depend upon whether Scottish English is more difficult than Indian English. It depends on your exposure. It depends on what you've done before. Yeah, if you've heard Scottish English before, like Gina, probably easy to understand me. If Scottish English is new for you, it's probably difficult to understand me. It's not something different in your brain. It's about experience. So no variety, as I said, is spoken more rapidly or slowly, but people have differences themselves. Hmm. This is the question that someone said to me before. It's a great question. For me, it's important that language policymakers and educators in Thailand and elsewhere recognize this diversity and take these perceptions into account when choosing their teaching. If you give someone one model, and then they do a test, and they get new listing materials, then, you know, they're not going to be prepared. Uh, I'll just, uh, just my last, my last thing. So worth remembering that learners in Thailand and elsewhere can make the choice of English as a model. I'll get back to you in a minute, Yusuf, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Okay, for instance, possibility that Thai English speech is a suitable model for Thai earners to use for intelligibility. But it's not for me to say, it's for people in Thailand to say. Okay, I've got some references. References here, some of it's mine, and some of it's things like Bell and Kachiru and Labov, which I also talked about. Most of the, what I've talked about today comes from my, my stuff. Um, Dr. Yusuf had a question. Okay, uh, uh, based on uh, what you have just presented, it seems like uh, there are many varieties of English nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, I mean, many scholars, researchers, and educators may wonder uh, which, I mean, when it's coming to the classroom, uh, which English should we taught in the classroom? Thank you. I, th I mean, this is a great question. I think that you have to teach different, when it comes to speech, this is my own opinion. You have, and, and you know, other people would disagree and I'm fine with that that you have to expose your learners to variation because in the world, they have to cope with variation. If you're teaching Thai learners and they're never going to speak to anyone who is not Thai and speaks, why not use Thai English as an example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's also a tension between what's good for them as people What's good for society and what have you got in the exam? So, for example, if all the materials in the exam are, I don't know, um, general American English, then you have to prepare your students for the exam. Mm -hmm. But there's a tension there. And also you could say that the exam itself doesn't reflect variation. Mm -hmm. So these are 
and I'm all I'm all you know as as you can see I'm very I'm a variationist so I'm very when I teach learners for example I'm I'm very eager to teach them about variation but the the learners themselves the the people who are learning the language or using the language they may not want that they may want to learn some kind of prestige variety of English they may want to stand in front of the mirror and say R with their tongue yeah because pe some people do it's not for me to say to you, say to them don't do that because all I'm doing is 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 replacing one idea with another but you know people like um you know some of your other speakers work in this more than me my my first monograph um social psychology of english in the as a global language about the attitudes of japanese learners and some of them some of them were very prejudiced against non native englishes that's that's a great question you so yes thank you for your answer I mean, I'm finished, so please, um, if Fatima, if, uh, if you want to ask other people, that's fine. Well, I think, well, everyone, like, um, curious to know, to have some more questions to ask you, uh, Dr. Robert. Well, okay, so I think, um, thank you very much, Dr. Robert, for the great presentation, and then it's time for Q&A, and then it looks like that we have some questions in the chat box. Dr. Robert is from uh, Valentin. Yeah, um, do you want me to read it out? Oh, thank you very much, Valentina. So in your opinion, what would be the future of English in terms of focus? <laughs> um, well, I think we've already got benchmarks and standards. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Th this is just my view. That's a really long question, Valentin. But the idea is, for me, is that to try and get people to be a bit more tolerant of variation, to be a bit more, less prejudiced against particular varieties and particular speakers. Um, to me, you know, we, we're very good with things like gender prejudice in the UK. Now, you know, we have male and female are a bit more equal than they were before. We're a bit less prejudiced about things like social class, but we're still very prejudiced against linguistics. That people, we still say, you know, that person doesn't speak properly or, this variety is not correct. So maybe it's about trying to get people to be a bit more tolerant generally. So the, by looking and I think the idea, for example, in world English is, is by looking at different varieties and looking at how people use them. We're then saying these varieties themselves are very systematic. They're very complex and they're very useful for the people who use them. So therefore, we should be a bit more tolerant of people, whether they're L1 speakers or L2 two speakers. Um, there's lots and lots of questions in there, though, Valentin. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, yeah, I'm asking this question because, you know, all the time we talk about world English is English is an international language. Yeah. And now there is a new or more recent trend, you know, translanguaging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, think, I think the focus at the moment or, or for a while has been on mutual intelligibility or basically the focus has been on the communicative aspects of the language or how well we understand each other in, a, in different contexts. Uh, but I think that in the future, the focus probably will be more on how people negotiate identities through yeah. their comment of the language. And actually, yeah. I was observing or I've been observing how native and non-native speakers would communicate in Thailand, for example, where I used to teach and uh, the emergence of those social pragmatic new features yeah. of how even native speakers would use Thai words, titles, for example, Ajahn, Kun, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, uh, very often they're not even aware of it, but it becomes part of that common yeah. repertoire. And and only after a while, people start doing research about it. And here in, in Korea, the Korean students have their own rep repertoire, and which, just like in Thailand, has not been registered yet as an official variety. Yeah. But it's more about the, I think in the future, the folks would be more on identity studies and, yeah. you, you know, negotiating status, negotiating identities. Yeah rather than just okay we want to make ourselves understood you know so yeah. 
I think that's what people nowadays talked about too much, but in the future, I think identity would be the main factor. I mean, you're absolutely right. As a social linguist, you know, when I started in the beginning, language isn't just denotational. It tells us about something who we are. But of course, intelligibility is a big part. If we can't speak to each other, then we can't communicate. But I think what you've been talking about is this negotiation of identity and ideas is you, what you're talking about is language change too. So for example, when I go to Thailand, I often go to Koh San Road, not because I want to see the backpackers, yeah? But I think it's very interesting because when you get, I quite often go down Koh San Road and listen to people buying things. You get the people selling, um, you know, selling the t-shirts and the clothes and you get the people buying it. They, they negotiate some kind of language between them. So, you know, if you ask the price, you might some someone say, no, same, same. Yeah, you probably heard this. Have you heard this in, in Bangkok? Oh, same, same? Yes, yes. This is a negotiating of, of, this is the way that variation and varieties emerge. Varieties emerge in this kind of contact. Now, I'm a variationist, so I, I look at it in terms of variety. You know, someone like, an, an, you know, someone like Jennifer Jenkins would look at that as, an, as a kind of English as a lingua franca. And you're talking about negotiation of identity. I think we're really talking about the same thing. It's just I, I've got slightly different um, because I'm a variationist and a social linguist. I've got a slightly different way of looking at it. But I think we're really talking about the same thing with different terminology. And you're absolutely right. Um, if you read some like a book like um, John Joseph's Language and Identity, I mean that's now 2006, so what's 17 years old. It's a whole book about negotiating your identity. I think the trouble with, with mentioning identity is identity is multifaceted. So it's kind of hard as a researcher to say, this person is negotiating their Thai identity. That's really a hard thing to say because you're not just Thai, you're Thai and female and young and um, from the South. So, you know, you're negotiating your identities in more than one identity at a time. But it's a great question. And I fully agree. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Valentin, for the question. And then we have two more participants raising their hand, uh, Mr. Mohammed and Mr. Tuna. So who wants to ask the question first? Mohammed? Mohammed. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for saying. Uh, respected sir, uh, Robert, Dr. Robert, I wanted to ask. <laughs> okay, come with Robert. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I wanted to ask just one thing that you talked when you gave the example, like, can you please pass or could you please pass in that thing? Um, it seemed to me like, does it come under the domain of discourse or discourse studies are also a part? It, does it come under the domain of sociolinguistics? Like, I think in the second edition of sociolinguistic by R.A. Hudson, he, he, he discussed that discourse has been established now as a separate discipline, but I think that he might be using it in his first edition, a part of his book. And the other thing you talked about, cultural impact, like the word privacy came into many other languages like, you know, to another. It came just from Western tradition where they are more concerned about this. Maybe in our culture, the thing is not like that. So the cultural impact on words and these things, so does cultural linguistics is a branch of sociolinguistics or it also has been established as a separate discipline like Farzad Sharifi and I think wrote a book on cultural linguistics working at Monash University. So these were the things confusing me, the discourse, uh, as, does it come under the domain and about what about cultural linguistics? Um, I mean, I think you're looking for, for, for yes and no and black and white answers. And I don't think you're going to find these, particularly for your first question. So social linguistics as a, as a field tends to be divided into social and regional. So I'm a variationist, I work in variation. It tends to be divided into social and regional variation and stylistic variation. So you look at variation between speakers and within speakers. I tend to look at variation between speakers, but other people look at variation within speakers. Now, 
to me, discourse analysis is another field, which is broadly, which, you know, um, which linguists also, I do a little bit of discourse, not very often, but now and again, but I don't, when I, I do a study, I don't think, hmm, this is discourse analysis or this is social linguistics. I just do my research. So I don't think you have to worry about what field you're working in. I work, as you can probably tell, half of what I do is psychology, social psychology, and half of it's social linguistics. But I don't particularly care. It just means I have to read more books. But I don't, I don't say, oh, I can't do this because this is discourse. Do the research that helps me. And sometimes I get it right and sometimes I get it wrong. Your second question is a bit hard for me because I'm a variationist. So I don't, so for example, when I did my research in Japan, you know, Japanese academics were saying, well, Japanese people do this and do that. Well, I, I actually, I was interested in gender differences and regional differences and rural and um, countryside and city differences and um, young and old differences. So, you know, to talk about Japanese culture is very odd for me, for, for me as a variationist, but people like, um, you know, Brown and Levinson, who talk about politeness theory, will talk about, you know, how people in Japanese express politeness and people in the US express politeness. But I find that quite hard because then you get into cultural stereotypes. You know, people in Pakistan are like this or people in um, Thailand are like this or people in Scotland are like this. It just gets, and you know, language is more more complex than stereotyping for me. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. There's got there's a question here about Thai uh, Thai in Australia. Yeah, yeah. From Kun James in the chat yeah. box. Uh, yep. That's a great question, James. Now, I, I've got a very um, a very indirect answer to this. Calling a variety something is not always based on linguistics. So, for example, when I showed you those English words which have been nativized into Japanese society, are these Japanese words or are they Japanese English words? And linguistically, I don't think it matters. Um, I think... When people say they speak a variety, the variety exists. So, for example, people talk about Thai English. Well, we can we can we can describe that variety, but many people don't accept it. So, it's not a variety till the Thai speakers themselves accept it. And of course, there's variation between the way different ways that Thais speak, speak English. Of course, there's variation. There's variation in Scottish English. Yeah, there's variation in Indian English. More people speak Indian English than speak Scottish English. Of course, there's variation. It's a variety if people say it's a variety. If the people who use it say it's variety, it's about, this is called nomenclature. The naming of something will tell you whether it's a variety or not. But it's a great, it's a great question. Of course, if it's one Thai person in Australia speaking that variety, then it's not a variety. It has to have some... Um, some number, some population, or some speech community. If you want to look at more on this, it's it's called ethnolinguistic vitality. Um, maybe I can type it in. Ethnolinguistic vitality. And if you want to read, the author is Howard Giles. Yeah, talked about, you know, the strength of varieties. And so, for example, um, let me give an example. Um, 100 years ago, Norwegian didn't exist. The Norwegian language didn't exist. People just thought it was a bad type of Denmark, Danish from Denmark. The Norway became independent and people said, we don't speak Danish. We speak Norwegian. That's your idea of varieties and languages, yeah? I don't speak a variety, I speak a language. The same happened in Yugoslavia 30 years ago. There was a language called Serbo-Croat, Serbian and Croatian. There was a war. Serbia became separate from Croatia. 
There's now two languages, Serbian and Croatian. The linguistics didn't change. The social situation changed. Yeah. Is it like Scotland becomes independent? We might say, I don't speak English. I speak Scottish. Possible. If you go to Lao, people will say, oh, I speak Lao, Laotian, Laotian. Uh, I speak Thai, I speak Isan Thai. They're mutually intelligible, Isan, Isan and Lao. Yeah. Well, I see the point. And is, is it like vernacular and dialect difference? This from these are just, again, these are just titles. Okay. Again, these are just, these are just titles. That, it, it's not actually about the linguistics we call something because we're trying to name it. Well, now I got it. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for that. No problem. And then, I think, I, I think Tuna's yeah, got a comment Tuna. too. Yeah, Tuna. Sorry, sorry, Tuna. No problem, uh, sure. Um, I've got a question, a uh, personal question, actually, that I want to ask you today in terms of the God song. Uh, whether then the variations of English and you know, the answer, the answer to which I'm too curious to hear from you uh, in academic. Uh, the Scots tongue, uh, as you know, is considered one of the dialects uh, of the English language speaking across Scotland. Here, the numerous uh, British papers also proved that uh, the Scots tongue is one of the Germanic languages similar to English. Uh, as, as a Scots speaker, I I can ask because there's a language that layer great. I He's want speaking in Scots. Sound... If you can't understand, he's speaking in Scots. <laughs> I know <laughs> that those is a language that I want to turn to eyes on what we consider the Scots to be. Okay. Are you asking my own personal opinion? Your personal opinion. Okay. When I was at school, uh, quite a long time ago, <laughs> um, how we spoke was sometimes considered to be um incorrect so instead of saying um i'm going to the town we would say i'm going to the tune because this is what i learned as a child when i went to school the teacher would say to me don't speak like that it's not tune it's town it's not dune it's down okay since i went to school scotland has become a bit more self-confident um, so the language, the, the, the way that we speak and its historical tradition has now been considered by many Scottish people, like most Scottish people, to be a separate language. Now, that's not really about linguistics. It's about politics. Yeah. So. Um, in schools now, we get as well as getting taught English, kids get taught literature in Scots. So they'll get taught of, they'll get taught to say down and down. Okay. Um, whereas now it's not considered correct by many Scottish people, it's con considered to be part of a literary tradition, a literature tradition. So it's not perfect, but it's moving in the right direction. And um, Chuno is absolutely right that there's lots of activists, you know, people who are interested in the Scots language. And, you know, I, I used to work at Glasgow University. There's a Scots language department. Yeah. So it's not wow. called Scots dialect or not very good dialect of English department. It's called Scots <laughs> language department. And things have changed. Yeah. And some of the ways in which they justify it themselves is there, there's a literature tradition from 500 years. And yeah. So there's kind of been a, a renaissance, a kind of a flowering. But yeah, I mean, people have different views. Okay. Okay. I know what I, I'm guessing what you think because you've got an, an Alba, um, an Alba sign on your Alba is the Gaelic word for Scotland. It's another Gaelic's another language in Scotland. That's right. Oh, thank you. Thank no you. problem. Thank, thank you for the question, Mr. Tuna. And then we have uh, Mr. Muhammad. So you have some more questions to ask. Yes, if the time allows. 
Okay, good. Sure. Make, make it quite short, Mohammed, because I think there might be other people who yeah. who want to ask questions too. Oh, for, yeah, for, for the other people, or if you want to like ask, you can raise your hands or you can type in the chat box so that we can raise the questions here. Okay, so Mr. Mohammed, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, sir, you talked about that language changes through time. So uh, people do make studies and researches on the endangered languages and the words which are disappearing from a language. Uh, like uh, you talked about legards and early adopters. So as sociolinguists or students or teachers of linguistics, when we know that, that this change happens and it's okay with us, we have to get uh, adopted to the new uh, changes that are occurring in that language. So what is the importance of those studies? Uh, do they just want to preserve those words? Sometimes an older generation is emotionally attached with few words and the newer words cannot uh, carry those meanings in them. Is there a need of preserving, or if we don't, we don't that we cannot preserve those few words which are disappearing, or the language in the same form to the next generation? So, what is the significance of studying and trying to preserve the language and those words, especially that are in danger? I think there's two. I think there's two questions here. The first is why are these studies important? Well, it's kind of like saying, well, why is history important? because we want to know what happened in the past, yeah? Um, the question of whether these dialects, these varieties should be saved or these varieties can be saved is, is a huge question. The, the first one's quite easy because it's kind of like saying, well, you know, historical linguist, linguist study change throughout time, yeah? Dialectologists have been trying to save varieties and languages because they think it's important. Um, if language reflects who we are, then it's nice to know how people used to speak, and it's nice to denote um, how people speak. Yeah, and differences. I mean, to me, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, should we save the tigers? It's the same argument. Yeah, of course we should preserve them, but also in, in terms of human human interaction, well, we need to know. Governments, for example, in Spain, when governments tried to ban languages in Spain during the time of Franco and the Spanish revolution, the Spanish fascist revolution, up until the 70s, they tried to ban Basque. They tried to ban Catalan. People just found other ways to preserve their language. Languages are preserved if speakers want to preserve them. Basques, for example, used to form hill walking clubs. They were banned from speaking the Basque language. They went up into the mountains and they spoke it there, where the government and the police couldn't see them. Same with Catalonia. If you know, if you like football, have you ever seen the team Barcelona? Barcelona is the centre of Catalonia. When Barcelona used to play football, they used to shout football songs in Catalan because they couldn't arrest 100,000 people. So that was the place where people would speak Catalan. Languages and varieties and words are preserved if people want to preserve them. Yeah. Um, for example, in Cornwall, which is in the south of England, southwest of England, Corn Cornish died out. It died out 100 years ago because people no longer wanted to speak it. That's how languages die out, not because governments tell people but yeah, should we preserve it? Yeah, because it's it's like saying, you know, should we should we be interested in our history? Of course we should. That's just my opinion. Please feel free to say something else. Um, other people, if you have a different opinion. Well, anyone want to add anything? Okay, I realize it's getting late in Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for you... dinner, I know. Yeah, almost. <laughs> okay. I, can, I, can, I can almost hear your stomach <laughs> rumbling. Well, so I think we have covered all and there's no more questions here, isn't it? Okay, so it's a great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robert, again for your insightful presentation today. And ha for me, I have learned a lot today, even though like I have listened to your talk last year and then recently last week. And then today I have <laughs> discovered new knowledge to me like wow. um 
uh, apart from knowing about the accent and dialect, so today I have another word that variation. So it's bigger than accents in, I mean, uh, in dialects that I have learned. So that, that's great for me. And then one thing that I learned that um, the benefit that we learn, the variation of the spoken language is not it now we, we uh, it's for us to understand people and then to embrace the people, the other people experiences and experience and background. It's not the way that we 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 can judge the other in terms of intel. Uh, I mean, what we call intelligence, or uh, I mean, or to judge other superior or inferior uh, from us. So so that's the thing to embrace other people exposure and experience so that we can understand each other. So that's the point. Okay, so great. Thank you all, and we appreciate your being with us today. And then, well, we care about your opinion. So can you please, at the end of the session, as usual, so can you please complete a short survey? And the evaluation link is provided in the chat box. And then last but not least, I have something to tell you to welcome the next year. So let me share you the screen. Well, here. So everyone, can you see the screen? We have more like amazing and interesting like topics coming uh, in 2023 in for PSU Open Mobility. So please stay tuned. So you can see like there are uh, seven topics and then uh, delivered by, um, I mean, the renowned scholar here, you can see from here. So for the date and uh, for the day, please stay tuned. Dr. Yusuf will provide you information uh, shortly. Okay, so it's not interesting, right? Well, okay, so now this is the evaluation QR code. So if you, uh, you can click the link in the chat box or scan the QR code here and then uh, please provide some uh, some feedback so that we can improve in uh, our session here. Well, okay. And then the other thing, um, once you complete the evaluation, you will get the e-certificate as well. And the e-certificate is also provided in the chat box as well. And then here is the other QR code for the e-certificate. Okay, so you can scan, either scanning or clicking in the chat box. Well, okay. So last but not least, again, thank you for Dr. Robert, your great time being here with us at the last event of 2022. And then we uh, wish you all the best for the next uh, new year. And then uh, also for the next, uh, and for the, for the next year coming event. So we encourage you guys to register and then to join us for the whole 2023 uh, events as well. And then um, if there is nothing for today, so we hope you have an enjoy evening and or morning for the other part of the world. And then <laughs> glad to see you here. <laughs> okay, and glad to see you here and hope to see you again next year. Thank you very much. Yeah. Or oh, Dr. Yusuf, you, you have anything to say? I know, just say thank, just say thank you for your actively participation and hope to see you guys again next year. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm Professor Robert and hope to see you in yeah. the UK next year as well. Oh, Dr. Robert, do you have anything to say for, I mean, to bid farewell for 2022? <laughs> <laughs> just the, um, the, uh, the that, that was, that was great. Thank you, everybody. And the, I like the look of the, the the sessions in 2023 you know people like bonnie you were talking about identity and global englishes people like bonnie norton and, and nicola galloway will will take those ideas of identity and um global englishes even further than me and into the classroom more than me too yeah i'll i'll if that's okay i'll just hang around with you just up in fact i'll have a very quick word with you after afterwards but okay until people Thanks. have gone but don't worry not not too Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so maybe. Yeah, it's done for this year. Thank you very much and hope to see you again next year. Thank you, hope to see you again next year. Bye bye, everyone. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks for organizing yeah, for us such a wonderful event. Thank you, you too. Thank Thanks, you very same. much. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, Ata Laila. <laughs> Thank you. Very okay, much. very you did very good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you my mom said, "Who's that?" 
And I said, Layla, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ajahn Kai. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, see you. Okay, so.